God. Now we've come to the book of Song of Songs. Last week we talked about Ecclesiastes. And praise God for the wisdom of Ecclesiastes. Now some of that wisdom I've just thinking about because this is really a kind of children's weekend. We had the children yesterday and thank God for those parents who brought their children to learn about Jesus. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes, remember your creator in the days of your youth. That's a wise thing to do. And thank God for all of us who were given exposure to the things of God when we were children. Amen. When I was young, my mother sent me to Sunday school. When I was nine years of age, she died. But she'd already installed something of the things of God in me by sending me to Sunday school. And even though after that was a kind of downward spiral for a long time, there was something in my heart which had the knowledge of the things of God. And in due course, it brought forth fruit. That with her prayers. Amen. Amen. So thank God for, for wisdom. And the, the sad thing is that we don't always do the wise thing. Sometimes we do the thing which doesn't bring fruit. And we have to ask God for wisdom. And But in the last day of the wisdom books, eh, we have Song of, Song of Songs. Eh, and we're going to have a look at Song of Songs. It's a short book. There's only nine chapters. It's very easy to read. You can read it in one sitting. And eh, I'd encourage you to do it. Now, I'm not going to give... Um, a main portion to read. I'll tell you what, give you an idea of how it goes. I'll read the opening verses and let me read the closing verses and then you'll get an idea of where we're going here. The, the Song of Songs, it, it begins, the Solomon's Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. Take me away from you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. So what, what's this then? Let's have a look at the last verse. Say chapter 9. Sorry, chapter 8. There's only 8 chapters. My mistake. Verse 14 of chapter 8. Come away, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. So we have this book, which is essentially a book of a love poetry, love poetry, and in this book we have many intimate statements, and intimacy is something, by the way, which probably needs more attention than is getting. We really need intimacy with Jesus Christ and the things of God, and we have been learning that. We've been studying. Corinthians, and uh, I'll maybe refer to that later on, because uh, we just read Corinthians there, chapter 11, it was a church that was wavered, and as a result of their waywardness, a lot of them actually died, because they were coming and breaking bread, they were taking the Lord's Supper, as it were, but they weren't living right, and uh, Paul addresses lots of issues in his letter to this church, who weren't living the life, they weren't being wise in what they learned and trying to get them back on the straight road. And he said, you know, that the, th the holy things of God are holy things. And he gives us a great impassioned plea to know the love of God in the middle of that book, to that church, from the book we just read. And this book here is all about love. Love, which is something we cannot see, but as the song says, it makes the world go round. And we get lots of statements in this book. And some of them you will know from our hymns, our hymnology. If you listen to some of the hymns that we sing, you'll see Jesus. My beloved is mine and I am his. We know we sing that with the kids, do we? I am my beloved and he is mine. And we read, and his banner over me is love. Is that right? Where do we get that? This book here. The beautiful wee song we sing in here, Sweet Rose of Sharon. Is that right? 
I am a rose of sheer and a lily of the valleys. Comes from this book. Now I don't know what you called your husband or your wife when you were courting. A lot of people had pet names for them, you know. I don't know what yours were, you know. Maybe you still call them it. Used to hear them down in England calling their wife Ducky and things like that. And pets. And I don't know what you are. You may have a, 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 a special romantic name for you. But anyway... We'll not go down that road, but the book goes down that road. And names are brought out which express an intimate, unique relationship that they have with one another. And I'm going to ask us to culture that, because if we don't get that, we'll never get revival, by the way. If we don't get this intimate, uh, unique relationship with the Lord, and how do we get that? Well, it's very simple. When you're courting somebody, <clears throat> you spend time with them. You make them a priority, and you don't let them down. And uh, that's what happens. And this book is a, a story of... It's actually it's done in the Hebrew in three different um, genders, if you like. Some of the, the language is written in the female t- forum, so you know that it's the, 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 the beloved... The, sorry, the... Um, the, the beloved one is the, the woman and then we have the bridegroom we get the male voice and then we get a plural voice as if there's a group of people who are speaking into the discourse it's quite um, a complex book to understand If you maybe need to read it a couple of times to find out what's going on and that's maybe what love's like it's not a thing that you tie down or work out it's something that interacts in life. So here are some of the, the verses that we know that point to Jesus Christ and, and our a normal Christian experience in the 21st century in songs and such like. Let, him, him, let me, him lead me to the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love. That's from this book here. Your name is like perfume poured out or as you have it in the King James Version, your name is like ointment poured forth. One of the, the songs we sing, a worship song. His name is like ointment poured forth. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. Uh, my beloved is mine and I am his. Uh, and then here's one you often see on gravestones, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. That right? You ever seen that in a gravestone? That comes from this book here, The Song of Songs, looking for the ultimate reconciliation. The ultimate reconciliation that even death cannot separate. Praise God, there is a love that cannot be separated by death, and it is to do with God's love for us. Nothing can take us from the hand of God, not even death. Is that right? Praise God. And that's a good verse to put on a gravestone because it's to do with uh, the ultimate love of one for another. And God loves us. The Bible says God is love. And uh, of course this book was written before the gospel was preached. It's an Old Testament book. And in olden days the, we know the, uh, the analogy that uh, we read it in Ezekiel in different places that about the Lord being betrothed to Israel. God being betrothed to Israel. And in the Jewish mind, it talks about God loving his people. Of course, when we get into the Christian age of the New Testament, I'll read you some of the verses. Uh, Paul the Apostle, verse, uh, Ephesians 5, he says, Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or such things, that, that she might be holy and without blemish. So you see this picture of the church being the bride of Christ, being brought into a unique relationship, that we are being united with God as his bride. You know, it's very, very deep to understand how great is our God. That he can actually take created beings like us and raise us to such a status as his bride. And Paul, the apostle, again writing to Corinthians, this church that he had a lot of trouble with, he said, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband 
to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. That again, Paul's a vision was to see a group of people a cleansed and purified and ready to be united as a bride and a, and a bridegroom are united. Some more verses here. And actually, it's probably John's teaching in the book of Revelation, which gives a lot of pace to the idea that in the Song of Songs, uh, the beloved is the, um, uh, and the betrothed is the church and is Christ. And that is the main thinking when you go through it, you can see that. We're going to actually uh, let you see a wee synopsis of what the book is all about before we actually talk about the love of God. And But let's read this verse. Revelations 19, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is a righteous deed of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you looking forward to the wedding? Amen. You're having a wedding in here on the 15th. But you're looking forward to that wedding. When the body of Christ is united with him for time and evermore. In eternity. You know Jesus said he wouldn't drink of this cup again. Until the kingdom. He is looking forward to a time when his redeemed people. Are brought with him into eternal union. In eternity. I don't think we get it. How great this thing is that we are handling here. I remember a man. In my own experience called Danny Ost. He was an evangelist in Mexico City. And the man had a passion. A passion. To see these Mexicans converted. Because he had an intimacy with Christ. And you ever met somebody like that? It strikes you. That man's got it. He's connected. And uh, I remember his own daughter was killed in a car accident out in Mexico. And the fella, he didn't have time to grieve. Such was his burden to see souls converted in Mexico City. He set up big, fantastic faith, hope and love centres. He bought big, big warehouses and turned them into churches and saw multitudes and multitudes come to Christ. Because he had a passion. As, as the Apostle Paul had, that the people would be cleansed and made ready to be united with God. Now what we're going to do, it, I'm going to show you a wee synopsis uh, from a theologian. There's a, a good resource called the Bible Project. And uh, it gives you a visual understanding of what the book's all about. Uh, as I said, we couldn't really take a portion of the book and explain what the book's all about. So this is an overview that will help your understanding. And then I'm going to pull out the main tenant, which is Jesus Christ, after we watch it. So if you excuse me just for a second, I'm going to help you with this. The song of I hope that helped focus your thinking on it. It helped mine when I did that, when I looked through this resource um, about the Song of Songs. Well, there we have it. Hey, about love. You've either got it or you haven't. Is that right? You don't get it in a training course. You know, a lot of people have got letters after their names. They've been to universities. And they, they spout their credentials. But we were studying in Corinthians. And we realised that even to do with the gifts of the Spirit, there was people who want recognition. And in Corinthians chapter 12, it's about the gifts of the Spirit. 14, it moves on to the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are wonderful things. Uh, wonderful experiences. But they don't give you credential for being anything special. Some people flaunt credentials to be special. 
But what makes you special is this thing, you've either got it or you've not got it, and it's called love. And if you've got it, commitment flows from it. We have churches today, and often there's a lack of commitment. People, if they treated their jobs the way they treated their churches, they would be sacked, because they come when they like. You don't go to work when you like. Uh, if you treated the, the person you were trying to marry in a take it or leave it way, sometimes on, sometimes off, you would never get married. Commitment is what a marriage ceremony is all about. People have grown towards each other in commitment and they consolidate it in the act of marriage. But here we have the spiritual experiences of the Corinthians and a lot of people say, well, my credentials are my spiritual experiences. But in the middle of it, Paul slots in a wonderful chapter which is very well known, 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to spend a wee bit of time looking at that because I think if we want to see Jesus in the Song of Solomons, we need to see Jesus in this portion here. Now, when I was a young Christian, I had spiritual experiences. Paul had spiritual experiences. I remember uh, one at a time, I wasn't a long a Christian, and I went away and I went out to a field and I sat and there was a bomb hole which had never been disturbed since World War II in this particular field. There was still this um, a indentation where a bomb had fallen during the Second World War and I sat in the middle of it and I cried to God and I cried to God and I had a phenomenal experience of the power of God coming down and touching me. Another time I had been out with a group that were doing some work. I was only about a teenager at the time, probably about 15 years of age, had just been converted. And we were down at a mission down in Glasgow a Cross. And I tried to minister to a man who had been steeped in a lot of deep types of sin. And uh, as a consequence, when I went home, I felt terribly, terribly oppressed with wickedness and evil, as if something had followed me home with, from the guy. And I was vulnerable, and I remember in the middle of the night crying to God, and something came into the room, and a power and a presence touched me. Another time, I, I was praying and seeking God, and a phenomenal power came on me and I started shaking like a leaf. Now, I was still a young boy at the time. I shared a bed with my brother. We were schoolboys. And my brother came in late. He'd been out gallivanting, getting into trouble. And he said to me, why can you not stop shaking? And I had to kind of make an utterance to him about what God had done to me while I was praying in bed. And to this day, he's never forgotten that. That's one thing he remembers. That night he came home and the power of God had touched me. And all sorts of things happened. But I wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit and I, I desired the Holy Spirit and I cried in God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And it never ever happened as such the way I expected it to be. So one day I didn't get home, we got, missed my last bus and I spent the night a, in a friend's house. But in the morning we went to this house, we were having a break and a bread service in a home. And a guy came along. Now, there have been a pre few preludes to this. People had ministered to me, and I'll not go into that. It's a story in itself. But this man stood and he said to me, is there someone seeking to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? I said, I am. He said, well, just pray. And he, just, he started to pray with me. And I wasn't, this was totally unexpected, this, this sequence happening in this meeting. This man turned up at the meeting. And as he prayed with me, I was expecting to feel all the electricity and all the power and all the energy going through me. That's what I was looking for. Instead of that, I suddenly had like a vision. And above me, I saw a balcony, like a balcony, and I saw Jesus Christ in this kind of mental vision. It wasn't a, uh, something ecstatic. But I just felt pouring out love. And love started to come down from the balcony. I just felt all this love going through me. Love, love, love. The power of love. And as the love was going through me, I found myself speaking in tongues. I was speaking in tongues. Now, a lot of people want the power. They want the 
They want all of these things, a recognition. But I'll tell you, let's read what Paul said when he was establishing a church. And if our church is going to be established, we'll need to learn this lesson. Because we're never... Do you know, there's people who will sit and text rather than look at Jesus and listen to what Jesus is saying. That's a curse that's happening in our society. They cannot focus their attentions anymore. And if we are praying, we need to learn to focus our attentions. Maybe that's one of the reasons the church is not doing so well. Because we cannot spend time in God's presence anymore. Because we have to go to our phones or we have to go to what's in our mind or we have to do it. And the devil is distracting us from love. Because we won't love Jesus unless we spend time at his feet. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and looked up into his face. And she became something wonderful as an example for us. And if we don't don't get that back in the church, it doesn't matter what good a word you can preach. It doesn't matter how your theology is. It doesn't matter how many qualifications you've got and what kind of size of an organisation you've got. If you've not got love, you're an empty barrel making a big noise. Is that not the truth? Because if we don't have a burden for souls, when we talk to them, we'll talk to them in the wrong attitude. If you're talking to someone who's going to hell, and in front of you you see a man who's going to hell, your heart will break for them. If you talk to a sinner as if these people are no as good as us and they should know better and they should respect our church and do. And you know, it's like somebody said to me yesterday, we were at meetings over the weekend, he said, you know, it's like fishing. You catch the fish and then you clean it. Some people try to clean up the fish before they catch it. God give us a burden and give us love. And Paul says, let me read this. He said, if I speak of the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror... Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. And now these things remain. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Will you join with me in praying that God will give us a baptism of love again? I really believe that in this harsh world we are living in somehow... Many of the saints of God have been tainted. Tainted with this world. And we've lost something which is the the fuel, the energy for seeing a church grow. We we were talking to a young man on Friday night. Now, we've been laboring over in Rutherglen on and off for years. And this young man's no longer converted. He was a drug addict. He was a street fighter. He's become converted just within the last few years. And already they've got 50 people meeting in a hall in Rutherland. Isn't that wonderful? Because love is in operation. We get mature Christians who've been on the road 40, 50 years and know their Bible back to front. They go to witness to people and they can't win a soul. Because something has been lost along the way. 
Something has been lost along the way. And when you love people, when I used to teach kids at school, the kids knew if you cared about them. They knew if you cared about them. And I think we're going to have an extended prayer time on Wednesday. Please try and come. If you've got something else on, say, no, I'm going to go to my church and I'm going to seek God. I'm going to seek God. Because we need a revival. This church is no, it's still in a fragile, fragile position. But we're not seeing growth. We're not seeing, we're going to move on in our Bible studies. We're not going back to Corinthians. We're going to study what the Bible teaches are the principles that make a church grow. Because unless we actually break through and get breakthrough, we're going nowhere. We're going nowhere. We need a breakthrough. And the breakthrough starts with a burden, with an actual commitment, with a desire. And that desire comes from God. Praise God for the love of God expressed in Jesus Christ. No greater love had any man than he had expressed to us on the cross of Calvary. Isn't God good this morning that he loved us? I don't think we'll ever really understand the love of God until we look at his face in the glory and we say, praise God, this is my life now, forever and ever, amen, because of love. Hallelujah. Now we're going to close with... Um, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded.